Ah, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. Just before we get started with this one, I do want to mention another relatively new channel that I have called Explored, spelled XPLRD, because apparently I hate vowels. It's more of a documentary style video than this channel, but I think if you dig the stuff here, you'll find the weekly explorations there. Get it? Explored's very clever big brain. It's fascinating. Whether it's looking at countries where insulting the king is a jailable crime to the use of diplomatic bags to smuggle cocaine. It covers a wide range of stuff, much of it quite similar to our topic today. New videos on that channel twice per week. Check it out, link below. Consider subscribing, yes? This is one mega project today that straddles different eras, one that is both of the 21st and the 15th centuries. A building that was said to be among the seven wonders of the medieval world, described by French mathematician Le Comte as the best contrived and noblest structure of all the East, but also one that met a sad demise in the 19th century only to rise once again above the city of Nanjing in the modern era. The porcelain tower of Nanjing, which gazes out over the Chinese city today, is not the original tower. That was destroyed during the 19th century Taiping Rebellion. But instead, it's a faithful replica of one of the most iconic buildings in Chinese history. Today's structure is simple, yet regal, tall but short by today's skyscraper standards. Sadly, almost nothing remains of the original porcelain tower of Nanjing, a pagoda that was said to shimmer magically in the sun and became one of the most famous buildings in the world over 600 years ago. Let's get into it. Today, Nanjing is a bustling Chinese city with a population just over 8.5 million, but its history goes a long way back. The name translates into English as Southern Capital, creative, and acted as the capital of various dynasties and governments, particularly between AD 220 and 589, and sporadically after that as well. This was a city that always held huge importance and still referred to as one of the four great ancient capitals of China, along with Beijing, Xi'an, and Luoyang. Its heyday came in the 15th century when, with an estimated population of 500,000, it was thought to be the most populated city in the world at that time. That's a lot of people for the 15th century. But a quick side note here, various Chinese cities and ancient Rome were thought to have already reached the 1 million population mark before that, but for whatever reason, they all suffered a sharp decline in numbers. But let's get back to Nanjing. If its glory days came in the 15th century when the construction of the porcelain tower took place, then its darkest hour began in the final weeks of 1937. As the invading Japanese army swept towards the city, few would have any inclination of just what was to come. And what came next was a six-week rampage of murder and rape that resulted in between 50,000 and 300,000 deaths, depending on your sources and, well, most likely your nationality. We actually made a video all about the rape of Nanking on, I believe it was my Geographics channel? But uh, if you if you YouTube searcher, you might find it, or maybe I'm not lazy and I link to it below. We'll see about that. The shattered city emerged from Japanese occupation just a ghost of its former self, but in 1946 it once again became the seat of the central government. A few years later it was once again attacked as the Chinese Communist People's Liberation Army overwhelmed the Kuomintang government forces who eventually fled to Taiwan. Like many cities in China, Nanjing has undergone a staggering leap forward in recent decades and is now home to a wealth of booming industries including IT, energy saving, and environmental protection, as well as new energy smart power grid stuff and intelligent equipment manufacturing. In 2010, the Zifeng Tower was completed a 450 meter super tall skyscraper, which is the tallest in Nanjing, the 11th tallest in China, and the 20th tallest in the world. The city had a glittering pearl to rival almost anything in the world except for the 19 others taller than it. But in the very same year, Wang Jialin, a Chinese businessman, donated a billion yuan, that's $156 million, for the reconstruction of a tower that might not be able to rival the Zifeng Tower in terms of height, but would re-establish a glorious structure not seen for over 150 years. God, it's interesting to be so rich that you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to pay for the reconstruction of some ancient tower, <laughs> just completely privately, and it costs well over $100 million. <laughs> Of course, the elegant porcelain tower of Nanjing was about to rise again.
But before we get to the new tower, let's go all the way back to the 15th century in the glorious period when the city of Nanjing was the most populated in the world. In 1412, during the Ming Dynasty, the Yongle Emperor Zhu Di ordered the construction of a tower that would eventually rise to nine stories in height and would form the most visually arresting section of the larger Bowen Temple Complex, which means Temple of Gratitude in Chinese. While it's a little unclear as to the exact purpose of the tower, apart from being very tall and very impressive, which has traditionally interested humans, it's funny how we just don't change. Some scholars have claimed that the tower was built to honor either both of the emperor's parents or just his mother. Maybe he built it for his mom and his dad was like, yo son, what the hell? And he was like, no, no, it's for you too. Yeah, sure, definitely for you as well. Yeah, definitely. The designing process got underway, but sadly the emperor did not live to see his vision realized and the construction was completed by his successor, the Zhuangdi Emperor Zhu Zanji, over 17 years later. Placed in charge of the building work and the general restoration of the Bowen Temple was none other than Zheng He. Now you might be thinking, Zheng He, Simon, never heard of him. But he was one of the most extraordinary naval explorers of his day and he commanded expeditionary treasure voyages to Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, Western Asia, and East Africa from 1405 to 1433, often using ships that dwarfed everything else being used at the time. This is also the book named in Gavin Menzies' book 1421, The Year China Discovered the World, as the real first non-native to reach the shores of America. To call this claim controversial would be putting it very, very mildly. While Menzies was able to present old maps, his theories were light on real evidence. But that had absolutely nothing to do with Zheng He, who certainly did command enormous sea voyages, but probably never went to America. In 1428, he was placed in charge of the construction of the Nanjing Porcelain Tower. Apparently, Fleet Admiral also equated to architect and project manager back in those days, but he was a man of many talents. He was also a eunuch which might explain his single-minded determination and not being distracted by other things. The original tower was completed in 1431 and stood at a hugely impressive 97 meters and was 30 meters in diameter at its octagonal base. Inside the tower was a staircase that wound from the ground to an observation point at the top and it included 184 steps. These stairs climbed through the nine temple levels, each becoming smaller than the last as the tower narrowed towards the top. Also along the stairway were small nooks where visitors would find Buddha statues, bells, and lanterns illuminating the way. One diligent visitor counted 140 lamps and 152 bells chiming with the wind, including those all also hanging outside. I mean, it, he counted to 152. <laughs> Diligence. The final level came with the pole running from the floor up through the roof where it emerged from the top of the structure as the porcelain tower's iconic spire with a set of iron rings and a carving of a pineapple seen as a large scale offering. From the outside, you could see small roofs protruding from each level, which all curved slightly upwards. Attached to these flanges, projecting rims, were the outer bells, larger at the bottom, but decreasing in size as the tower rose. As impressive as its height was, the porcelain tower was not the tallest pagoda in China when it was completed. That award remained with a 100 meter tall wooden pagoda in Changyang, built in 611, but which no longer exists. But while it may not have been a true record breaker, it was widely considered the most beautiful pagoda in all of China. Unlike other pagodas built simply with wood or even the Liaudi Pagoda, which remains the tallest brick pagoda in the world at a height of 84 meters and was completed over 500 years before, the porcelain tower was built with porcelain bricks, which were said to shimmer in the sun. This was combined with a mixture of green, yellow, brown, and white glazes in the designs of animals, flowers, bamboo, landscapes, and Buddhist images. Word of the tower quickly spread far from the borders of China. Western travelers gazed in amazement at its beauty, and it wasn't long until replicas began appearing in Europe. In London, Kew Gardens installed their own version of the tower, albeit on a smaller scale, while a 2.7 meter porcelain replica still resides at the Victoria Albert Museum. It was a delightful structure that was the envy of the world, but like any building of such symbolic power, it was also going to be a target. And when I say target, I mean both through man's own destructive hand and the fateful circumstance of nature. Its first attack came from the sky. In 1801, the porcelain tower was struck by lightning, knocking off the top four levels. For nearly 50 years, it remained as it was, damaged, but still strikingly beautiful. But alas, large-scale rebellions tend not to give great regard to beauty and historical monuments. The Taiping Rebellion erupted in 1850 between the ruling Qing Dynasty and the theocratic Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, a Christian uprising led by the revolutionary and self-appointed Heavenly King Hong Shi Kuang. By the way, he referred to himself as Jesus' brother. 
Using Nanjing, then Tianjing as its capital, the so-called Heavenly Dynasty eventually expanded to include much of southern China and control over 30 million people. That is an effort. While there was no doubt plenty of honorable social reforms involved in fighting, an overambition finally put paid to the Heavenly Dynasty in 1864. With his enemies laying siege to Nanjing, Xie Quan was said to have died from accidental food poisoning after eating wild mushrooms. Once the Qing soldiers had forced their way to Nanjing, Xie Quan's body was exhumed for identification before being cremated. His ashes were then loaded into a cannon and fired out of it to ensure that there was no final resting place for this rebellious leader. But anyway, enough about that stuff, let's get back to the tower. As fervent Christians determined to rid China of its Buddhist ways, followers of the Heavenly Dynasty began destroying the porcelain tower sometime around 1850 and 1854. This was when a visiting American described entering the hollowed out remains of the tower. In 1856, the rear end came as Heavenly Dynasty soldiers finally destroyed the tower for good. Pieces of the once beautiful building were salvaged and used for other buildings in the city, with possible original fragments even finding their way to the Calcutta Museum in 1877, though these have never been definitively identified. What was widely regarded as one of the jewels of medieval architecture now was no more. As I mentioned earlier, Nanjing experienced mixed fortunes over the next 150 years, but with the dawn of the new millennium, it became clear that Chinese power and prestige was absolutely roaring back. Much of this was centered on commerce, trade, and modern architecture. The involvement of the Communist Party in China has certainly not been kind to the nation's historic monuments, although perhaps the most famous Beijing's Forbidden City was thankfully spared the revolutionary vigor of destruction. And if you're interested in that, we've recently done a video all about the wondrous Forbidden City, so why not check it out after you finish watching this video? In 2010, China's richest man, Wang Jialing, donated a billion yuan, that's $156 million, as I said, to build a full-scale replica of the Porcelain Tower, as well as the Porcelain Tower Heritage Park project. At the time, this was reported to be the largest single personal donation ever made in China. Both the new tower and the park were opened in 2015. Built almost entirely of steel, the modern Nanjing Tower may not have the romantic aura of its predecessor, but it's certainly the next best thing. Today, a visit to the new tower is a true 21st century experience where visitors can use QR codes around the site to gain a better understanding of its turbulent past. One room inside comes encased with mirrored walls and thousands of light bulbs, each constantly changing color, said to replicate a room in the original pagoda. <laughs> Not really. It's said to represent the Buddhist concept of light. It has been described as a 90s-inspired Buddhist dance floor. Whether or not that was the plan, we're not entirely sure, but I'm gonna go ahead and guess it wasn't. But it's not all modern lights and disco balls. Inside, you can find the ruins of the original structure, though not much of it, it must be said. Sadly, all we know of the original tower comes from the scant local information, travel logs, and various pictures drawn. It's impossible to get a clear sense of what approaching the glinting beauty of the porcelain tower of Nanjing must have been like back in the 15th century. With the heydays of Rome and Athens disappearing into the distance, the medieval period is not necessarily associated with beautiful, enduring monuments. Yes, some mighty impressive castles were built across Europe, but they lacked the grace and sophistication of the tower in Nanjing. And what we see today is very much a modern take on an old treasured relic. It is, of course, not the same, but in 600 years, who knows, we'll probably think of it differently. The Porcelain Tower of Nanjing is the tower that fell once and rose twice. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, you know what to do. Smash that like button below. Don't forget to check out that other channel I mentioned at the start, Explored. I'm linking to it below. And thank you for watching.